Hello, everyone. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in healthcare IT. And today we have an interesting mix, a couple of people from a couple of different companies, which will provide a, a nice, interesting perspective. First, we have Curtis Gaddis. He's co-founder and CEO of Leading Reach. And we also have Dr. Jeff Bullard. He's chief medical officer and chief product strategy officer of Catalyst Health Group. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so before we do dive into today's topic, how about you tell us briefly about yourself and your company? Uh, Curtis, you want to start? Yeah, happy to do so. Hi, everyone. My name is Curtis Gaddis. As mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Leading Reach. Leading Reach is an Austin, Texas-based company. Ultimately, our goal is to kill the fax machine in healthcare. So we are a company that is focused on improving communication and care coordination. And, you know, obviously, folks fall through the gaps all the time. And, you know, the stats say 50% of the time that a patient gets referred by fax, they never make it to their appointment. And as we look into the future and we start thinking about things like value-based care and really trying to take care of the patient in a more holistic manner, uh, groups like Catalyst that Dr. That Dr. Bullard works for really have transitioned away from faxing and really putting more accountability and transparency into what's happening with their patients by leveraging leading reach to really, again, manage that communication and care coordination between two settings of care, which really could be not just a primary to specialist visit, but as we're going to talk about today, you know, really anything that could impact, you know, the social determinants of health uh, and really taking care of patients that fall under that safety net umbrella. You've uh, chosen a formidable opponent, uh, Curtis, but <laughs> anyway, it's great. To, I mean, it's an effort that needs to be done. So it's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff, you want to tell us about yourself and your company? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and hello, everybody. Great to great to be here. Um, so uh, I'm a family physician by training. I've uh, been in practice since 96. Um, you know, one of the things that was always important to me in practice was uh, this intersection between technology and patient care. Um, we started our practice uh, back in 98. Uh, we had electronic health records. Uh, that were, you know, one of the first kind of early adopters for electronic health records. And, and through the years, I've spent a lot of time trying to bring technologies and actually created some technologies out of our practice um, for healthcare uh, access and for some uh, equity in terms of care and um, the ability to scale things like mental health across uh, practices. So uh, now I have the ability and the honor to work for Callus Health Group, uh, which is kind of a complex company and that we have a, a lot of things going on under the hood at Callus Health Group. So we have a network first, Callus Health Network, that's about a thousand PCPs across Texas. Wow. Um, independent PCPs pull together in a clinically integrated network and, and we operate um, under value-based contracts. So a lot of work uh, that we do on that side. And then we have a platform side of the company where we build technology to try to help power what we're doing on the value-based side. Uh, we build some of those technologies and we partner with folks um, to really try to help drive the value of care. Um, one of those folks is Curtis and his company. Uh, we've been using Leading Reach really for the last five years. Right? It was since I think we're one of the early adopters of Leading Reach, and so there's a lot of power in that tool. And we're really recognizing there's a lot of power in lots of ways we can use technology to drive outcomes and patient success and provider reach and all those types of things. So, so it's a it's an exciting time in healthcare. And like you said, it's a it's a hard it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to do. <laughs> Uh, but we're just trying to knock it down one one brick at a time. Great. So one of the interesting things as we as we start the discussion today is really around chronic care management and kind of the focus of that in so many parts of healthcare. Healthcare. Are we finally like turning the corner when it comes to proactively addressing chronic conditions, or what would you say the state of chronic care management is today? Maybe you could start, Jeff. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I think. Um, the idea that we're turning the corner. Yeah, I can get behind that. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of work still to be done. Mm. Um, the, the, um, the positives that I would probably point out are we're definitely engaged in a lot more conversation around um, chronic care and, and the importance of really wrapping processes around um, chronic care and, and how we manage patients with a heavy disease burden. Um, there are processes that are being put in place, I think, in great organizations across the country uh, to help actually enable care of chronic uh, disease. I think there's a lot of things that are being done across the country to, to help 
providers and their reach and, and you know, um, creating more of a longitudinal experience for chronic disease mm -hmm. than the episodic one we're also used to and, and have sort of been brought up in. I think where the, the big challenge comes in though is from a payment standpoint, there's not a, a lot of alignment for payment around moving forward at a quicker pace. So, you know, there's this set of push pull kind of thing where you, 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 you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to skin the cat, um, you know, chronic disease in a system that really doesn't support it. it. It supports us, you know, seeing patients that are sick, not patients that are well or trying to keep patients well. Uh, it doesn't really support things much outside of that face-to-face -face visit. So, you know, it, it feels a little bit like we're, we're, um, <laughs> we're driving down the highway in a car that's heading a certain direction and we got our arms out the window and we're trying to thread together some things to help, you know, take care of folks on the side rather than redesigning what that vehicle could and should look like. Um, so, yeah. I, so, so yes and no, I would say <clears throat> yes. And boy, we could sure pour some gas in the fire if we could do some things differently around payment. Yeah. Payment is key. Curtis, what are you seeing across your, your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, from our perspective, it's really about facilitating the team-based approach. And, you know, as, as we get deeper and deeper into to working with folks like Catalyst, we're just learning more about where patients fall through the cracks, right? You know, if, if you've got a, a patient who needs uh, not only maybe a, a car, has a cardiac condition, but also has housing or food insecurity, right? You need a lot of folks that you're bringing into that equation, right? Uh, social workers, case workers, uh, and then, of course, obviously empowering that PCP to really be the quarterback of that patient's health. And, you know, again, a lot of times we talk about, you know, once that patient gets over to that cardiologist, what happens, right? You know, and, and many times, you know, PCPs really struggle with that closing of the loop. Uh, and it's really difficult for, for them to truly be that quarterback and be effective at their job of taking care of that patient when they lose that visibility. So we are really endeavoring uh, to, to push our technology in ways that really help uh, more than one person get access and visibility into what's going on. Uh, and it's been really, really exciting and, and really fulfilling for us to start to understand, you know, if you've got a heart failure patient, it's not just a, par a primary care and a cardiologist, right? You've got a subspecialist, uh, you've got pharmacists, and again, nursing, nursing teams and all kinds of folks uh, that are out there that are responsible and, and, and really impactful on that patient's care. So, you know, when we start talking about managing millions and millions of patients, it's really about that ability to really flag the high risk ones and then have that navigation team really facilitate that patient through that care journey. Uh, and we've seen that that obviously helps, uh, you know, improve not only the communication and care coordination, but ultimately the outcomes and the health of that patient. So let's dive into that, right? Who should be doing this? Uh, I hear a lot of people say the PCP, and that makes sense. Although I don't even have a PCP, so that's not going to work great for me. So maybe I'm biased in this <laughs> perspective, right? But I'd also, I mean, just playing devil's advocate, PCPs are, are burnt out with their 15-minute appointments, <laughs> you know, 40 times a day or whatever the number is, you know, uh, you know and so they're you know, burnt out and you know, I would advocate that most of the education that PCPs get isn't around wellness, you know, to Jeff's point, it was around treating a, you know, a sickness or illness. So, you know, how do you see that, Curtis, you know, who is the right person to address chronic conditions? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And probably one better for, for Dr. Bowler than for Curtis. I'm just, yeah, thinking, <laughs> sure. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you my take, you know, at, at, you know, and then I'll hand over to Jeff there. Um, you know, from, from our vantage point, uh, again, we work with everybody in healthcare. So folks who are really focused on value-based, folks who are firmly in the fee-for-service universe. Uh, and, and again, from my vantage point, it really does seem like it is the PCP who needs to take the lead there. Uh, yeah. And again, kind of what Jeff said earlier, right? You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm an orthopedic surgeon, right, you know, it's, it's going to be an episode and you're going to send me something and, you know, hey, I like cutting on knees and I get paid to do so. So I'm going to do so, right? And that's just kind of my, my motivation. So I think, you know, what Jeff was alluding to earlier around the incentive models are really, really key to drive driving this shift. But again, you know, what, what I've seen in, in the successful organizations, much like Catalyst and those who are taking risk that we've seen, it really is those PCPs that are stepping up and really taking that ownership of that patient's care. Uh, and again, when the incentive models are aligned, uh, it seems to be working at least, you know, kind of where we are here in 2022. But Jeff, you're the expert here. I'll go ahead and hand off to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have a, a question or a wonder about whether it should or shouldn't be the PCP. I think we've seen enough evidence to support that if you can get a PCP at the center of care, you're going to drive down costs, you're going to improve outcomes, and you're, you're just going to have a better experience overall. And the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine had their report last year that came out that said PCPs are the one variable in healthcare that, that is shown 
and that you would want to actually improve the outcomes for patients. Um, I think what Curtis is, is um, talking to, and, and it's been demonstrated um, in our organization, but on a bigger scale in states that are investing more in PCPs or countries that are investing more in primary care, is that once you have some dollars in the right place, and then you start coordinating care through the PCP setting, but across the patient's journey, that's where you see the magic kind of kick in. So if, if I can use a tool and technology to help connect that patient, well, let me give you an example. So um, in the typical setting, if I've got a patient that I need to send to a specialist mm -hmm. uh, without referral management, without some coordination of care, what, what often happens more often than not is the patient's given a card that says, hey, make an appointment with this doc. Or the patient is just kind of left to go find an orthopedic, go find, go find somebody. And then, and then there's the disconnect. I'm unplugged um, as, as the PCP provider from the experience. The patient is left to really self-manage that experience. They're the go-between between the specialist and me or the specialist and the, the hospital. I'm just every, you know, the imaging center that might need to do some imaging. So they're left in this sort of place where they're not equipped to navigate this really complicated healthcare experience. Um, and, and so you see the results that we have today. Uh, by connecting through technology and processes and care team members, um, the patient and their experience through that whole journey, then now I get to lean in and say, well, I don't really think you need this, or I think you need that, or you've already had this imaging, let's get it pulled together for you, um, make it available to the, the people that need it, the stakeholders that are actually gonna look at it and do something with it. Let me pull in um, folks from a, a care team, the, the nurse that's gonna be able to answer questions when you're having some challenges after surgery, the, um, the social worker who's going to help make sure you've got transportation back and forth to rehab so you have actually a good experience as you're trying to rehab that, that knee, the mental health provider who, you know, yeah, you've got some, you're a patient with depression and you've had surgery and your mobility's down and your mood's decreasing and you're not really taking care of yourself. As much. All of those things can be brought to the table and coordinated around the patient and really help the patient get a better experience. Um, and, you, and you really, I think, need the PCP in the driver's seat to make sure that, you know, nothing's getting dropped and they're not going to do the knee surgery, but they're sure going to make sure the patient gets from point A to point B to point C well and in a way that makes sense uh, for that patient's healthy outcome. So we've been at Catalyst um, because we're operating under value-based contracts, and Curtis pointed to this as well. We, we've got some dollars that flow in to help support those care management processes and mm. to help us actually use technologies in a way that connects the patient um, to their to the their whole healthcare experience and we see total cost of care reductions we see patients with better outcomes we see better human malignancies we see all those things as a result so yeah, i think it's a um it's a stacking you got to have the pcp at the center but you got to have all the other things too in order to really you know get that maximum impact yeah well Anecdotally, Curtis, it's a bit ironic that I actually have my my orthopedic surgeon on text, uh, which probably says more about my my sports addiction than uh, anything else. But <laughs> because that's it, you know, he's almost my right. PCP. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, to your point though, right? The key question to me that comes out of this is, what does the PCP need to be able to do this effectively? Uh, you know, you already kind of addressed better reimbursement. That would help a lot of things, right? But is that what you need, Jeff? Is, you know, is it technology to facilitate the access to data? Is it people to take care of the, you know, the basic stuff that a doctor shouldn't be doing because it's not really needed? You know, is, in, you know, is that that whole team approach? Or is it kind of what Curtis said earlier, right? Which is, okay, well, I'm going to take care of this population of patients, but if I get all this data, I need, you know, some AI or something to understand what data really matters and needs to be escalated. Like what's really the core thing that's needed, you know, for an overwhelmed PCP to be able to address this? Yeah. Which, which I think actually also speaks to the burnout challenge, right? So there's, yeah. <laughs> so right now PCPs, it, it, you know, in my, in my world, a PCP unconnected from everything else, operating kind of in the traditional way. I'm spending all day um, documenting. So I'm using technology, my EMR, but I'm using it in a way that is not impactful in terms of patient care outcomes. I'm using it as a billing tool. Exactly. And so I'm converting my meaningful experience with the patient into a documentation process where I'm uncoupling the patient story and I'm putting it in bullets and then sending it to get paid for it. 
Um, that's not the experience we need. I think the experience we need actually takes the PCP and then you start layering all of those things you mentioned in for incremental improvements and, and gains and in, in outcomes. So a care team in my office is certainly um, a huge benefit because then I can take that episodic experience. I'm seeing you right now as a patient. I have a few minutes with you based on this fee for service model we're under. And I'm gonna then hand you off to some care team members who are gonna do those things like some inquiry into your social determinants of health and really understand what are the things that are gonna impact your ability to successfully engage in a care plan that I might be giving you um, and, and really power up that experience that the patient has. The reality is we can't staff every PCP office with that kind of a care team. So um, pulling those care teams together and then using technology to thread the communication and interaction together, I think is the next layer where you have to have the technology. You have to have, I'm guessing, John, you probably really love the ability to pick up your phone and text your ortho and get an answer. Back. That's what patients want. That's what patients want. And that's what the docs. And he's my friend, which is why I'm able to do that. <laughs> to your point, right? I wouldn't otherwise. <laughs> it's the relationship piece of that. And the relationship is more meaningful and impactful because it's longitudinal. It's not something that you, you don't just see them four times a year and that's it, or two times a year or once a year. You get to actually engage and build rapport and build a relationship. That's what docs want too. That's the, you know, we think of the Norman Rockwell doc experience. You're part of the, you're part of the community. Docs want that. They want the ability to do that. Patients want that. It's just, it's the way we want to deliver care. It's the way you want care to be received where it's, it's the tools for engagement are more relational. Those are the kinds of things we're trying to build um, when we're building in technologies, the ones that power those meaningful experiences. It expands reach as well for the PCPs so that they now have a place, uh, an experience where they can take care of more people because they've got a team to support them in doing that. And then the third part that you um, uh, uh, touched on, which I think is extremely important, and I don't think docs really understand the importance yet. I don't think it's been implemented in a way globally or not globally, but holistically that's, that's important and meaningful. And, and that's the whole AI, ML, you know, the analytics piece where we've got to use the power <laughs> of the uh, you know, the, the technology that we have to help us understand and appreciate who, where is that most impactful outreach? Where, where should I be focusing my time and my energy and efforts to make sure I'm moving a population in the right direction, picking people up when they need it the most? That, that's the kind of stuff that I think we need all stacked up together to get us to that result that we're, you know, we're all kind of running after, but making slow, steady steps towards. Yeah. I mean, your description of doctor's current use of technology was so apt. I, uh, I, it actually reminded me of a tweet I saw this morning from uh, Linda Stotsky. She said, it's kind of sad that we're still working on the EHR optimization issues, right? Mm -hmm. And she's someone who's been implementing uh -huh. EHRs for a decade or more, right? And then yeah. the CIO, Aaron Meary, who uh, you, you may know, he's, uh, he's on the hit that committee, all sorts of things with technology too. He actually said, I fixed it for you. It's kind of sad we're still using EHR HRs and not something truly comprehensive, which yeah. I think is to your point, right? Like that we're still using them as billing engines rather than as care improvement platforms, right. uh, which is what I, it sounds, you know, everything else that you described to me is that, right? Is, is that what you're seeing, Curtis? I mean, it's, I think that's what you're working towards, right? Is saying, get rid of the facts. Let's find something that's actually more effective that improves patient care. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, again, if you put yourself in Dr. Buller's position as a PCP, the frustration is as soon as that patient leaves my office, right? I know I've got a patient and I may be managing a patient with multiple disease states. So I need to send them to, you know, a bariatric surgeon or orthopod and, and maybe even an oncologist or a cardiologist or whatever that case may be. And they lose that picture. They lose that control. And, you know, one of the top frustrations for PCPs behind burnout and having to use their EMR is that lack of the closure of the loop, right? What happened to my patient once they, once they leave that office and, and can I understand what happened and can you close that loop for me? And unfortunately right now, there's just not enough focus on that in healthcare, right? Again, you know, those specialists get those patients and they do what they do and they're all well-intentioned, I'm sure, but there's just a huge gap in that closing of the loop and what actually happened. And maybe I can get it in claims data, 90 to 180 days in arrears and find out what <laughs> happened to my patient, but that doesn't help them quarterback the patient, right? That doesn't help them do those things. 
So we're really all about shining a flashlight, honestly, on that. And we even put scorecards in place for folks like Dr. Bullard to hold their network accountable. Hey, you're doing a great job, you know, picking up my patients and, and, and getting them access, those that get appointments, but only 30% of them are actually getting an appointment and showing up. That's not great. You could be the greatest cardiologist in town, but if I can't get my patients to you, I'm going to have to find somebody that I can work with. So right. we're shining a flashlight again on, you know, what has traditionally been a black hole, right? Those, those PCPs are in their EMR, just hitting that fax button and it fires off in, into the ether and they have no idea what happens 90 plus percent of the time. And so we're trying to put that visibility in there so that they can be more proactive, right? If that loop does get closed and I find out what's going on with my patient when they see the cardiologist, we as a team can now start to approach and do things that actually will impact that patient versus letting these conditions go on longer and longer, where of course that gives that patient the, the, the greater opportunity to get, uh, get unwell. So that's really for us the, 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 the crux of it all, right? Is visibility and transparency and accountability into what's actually happening once they, they leave the, the, the walls of that care setting when they're sitting there with their quarterback and their PCP. And again, holding everybody accountable to, to a higher level of communication at the end of the day. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a doctor I worked with who was working on a CCM program, right? A chronic care management program. And this is how he marketed it to patients. He said, I'm sorry, but when you leave this room, I'm not going to think about you again. <laughs> He's like, but if you sign up for this program, I will. Wow. So you should sign up, which, you know, it's kind of a sad state of, of, of where we are at and how our reimbursement system is. Right. And, you know, back to, you know, Jeff's point around needing more reimbursement, but let's shift gears a minute too, to, uh, you know, just in another layer of complexity in addressing the chronic care management problem is SDOH, right? Social determinants of health. And, you know, I actually heard someone call it social detriments of health, which I thought was an interesting uh, twist, uh, which still applies to SDOH. Um, you know, as you look at that, like it's so influential on the whole chronic conditions. But, you know, again, how do we get that overwhelmed PCP to address these SDOH challenges? Uh, you know, what, what's the model that works there? Uh, what, what are you working on? Uh, Jeff, maybe you can start. Yeah, so the, the first part of that is I don't, you don't, I don't think you get the overworked PCP to address it in an okay. exam. It doesn't happen. It just, there's, there's no time. There, the window doesn't exist. I don't so think. So who does it? So I think you have to actually pull a team around the PCP and you have to make this uh, intentional effort to say, I know about your disease state. I've just looked at your hemoglobin A1C. I know where your blood pressure is. I know these variables about you and that's part of you. And I'm trying to use those metrics as a way to measure success in terms of treating your condition. And I know there's also a lot more to you than that. So I'm going to hand you off to or work with somebody that works with me, um, the social worker and the nurse and the care coordinator to really understand and appreciate you more globally. I need to understand the things that are keeping you from being successful. It's amazing to me when I think about the number of and, and I've done this, uh, I've done this a lot, you know, walk in a room with a patient who's a diabetic and I start talking about things that we need to do to address their diabetes and how much time have I really spent talking to the patient about what diabetes is um, so that they really have a true fundamental understanding of diabetes. How much time have I asked them if they understand um, the importance of once a day or twice a day dosing and the, just their health literacy um, right. questions uh, can consume a lot of time and and it's sad to say, but I think it's the reality that I don't ask those questions because I don't have the time to sit and listen to the answer. I want to know the answer and I would do something if I had the answer in front of me, but I don't really, it's a, you know, it's a double edged sword. We're, we're kind of in a double bind, right? I, I want to know, but I don't want to know because I need to get to the next room where somebody else needs something else from me and our interaction. So I think it is, it has to be pulling together folks that can support the experience um, and extend the reach and, ex and extend the impact. Uh, I don't think it can be done in the PCP setting by itself. Well, and it uh, feels like that conflict is contributing to the burnout too, right? Because every happened? doctor I've met pretty much cares about the patient and wants to care for the patient, but they also need to get paid and they need to get home to their kids at, you know, after, at the end of the day. So it's such a, that, that's a conflict, right? That causes even more burnout. Yeah, I think when you think about burnout, when I think about burnout, I think that there are a couple of main causes of burnout in my mind. One is the documentation, administrative kind of burden. Sure. They're, they're spending a ton of time as docs, more than, way more than half of their time 
is spent documenting and, and checking boxes than it is actually seeing patients. So, you know, when you boil down the face-to-face -face time a doc has with a patient, it's way less than the amount of time they're spending doing other stuff. And that time is actually rolling into their evenings. It's time they could spend with patients. It's actually time they could spend with family and friends, but they don't get to do that. What they really, I think, um, what, what I think would turn it around is we look, we need to look for ways to, to actually spark joy back in, in the providers that are out mm -hmm. there taking care of people. They've got, I think there's a, a purpose driven kind of experience that they're looking for that they want that involves that relational experience and being part of a patient's journey, not just a documenter of their journey. Mm. So we've got to figure out how to introduce that back in. And I, again, I think it comes back to uncoupling this, this sort of fee-for-service model, move into more of a wellness approach where we just, you know, we get a capitated payment and you're paid to keep people healthy, period. Um, and you do it any way you see fit, have as long of an appointment as you want, <laughs> pull as many people on your care team as you want, but your focus is to keep them healthy. Yeah. Well, and, and we've, uh, yeah, I think people are finally coming to realize that we don't want, most of us don't want to abuse our healthcare system. It's not like I'm like, oh, I can't wait to have more time with my doctor <laughs> like right. unless I really need it. Right. <laughs> like, you know, so that, you know, that, that's interesting. Uh, Curtis, how about from a technology perspective, where are we at in kind of supporting these initiatives, whether it's the PCP who maybe just needs to know, hey, there is some health literacy issues or there are some SDOH related issues that need to be addressed. So I should, you know, introduce them to our care manager or, or whether it's supporting the care manager, you know, how, how are we helping them with this information and, and then even connecting them to resources? Great, great question. Uh, it's a lot around communication, right? A lot of what, what we do, we compare ourselves a little bit in, in some of our feature set to, to companies like Slack or Microsoft Teams that we're all getting accustomed to now in this pandemic yeah. environment where we can have different channels, right? And so we can actually start to bring in those care teams, nurse navigation teams or social services teams. So for us, again, it's really about that theme that I've been talking about of communication, right? And, you know, again, the PCP is, is, very, very limited in their time, right? And again, well-intentioned as we've, we've talked about almost 100% of the time, but they just don't have the time and the opportunity to really peel the layers on the onion back. But if they can get, to, get in there and do that quick identif identification using technology, we can start to loop in those teams very effectively. Hey, nurse navigation team, this is a high-risk patient. Let's flag these patients and then let's go ahead and have the support staff around them go in and, and, and begin that navigation, if you will, or facilitate that navigation. So for us, we're very, very fortunate to work with a lot of the social services kind of entities across the state of Texas and beyond. So mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that is really fulfilling for us is we go in and help, you know, organizations that are, are addressing these social determinants of health and housing and food insecurity and those kinds of things. And we connect them on our network, just like anybody else. And so again, people many times think about, well, a digital health network is going to be primary cares and specialists and imaging centers, but we don't think about it that way. It can be literally anybody and everybody, you know, you've got attorneys that participate on our network because they're personal injury attorneys and they need mm -hmm. to have HIPAA compliant file, file transfer and communication. So we bring in, again, transportation companies, you know, and, and, and work with, you know, again, you know, the food, local food pantries and those kinds of things, anybody and everybody. In fact, I live in Austin, Texas, the Travis County Jail uses le leading reach because prisoners are patients too, and they need care coordination, right? So for us, we really try to think big. Anywhere where there is a potential fumble, i.e. a fax, a phone call, an email, and we put again, really accountable kind of communication. Everything's time stamped and dated. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. In our universe, no one, hey, John, I didn't get that fax. Can you resend it? That stuff doesn't happen in a digital environment, right? Everybody knows exactly what's going on. And again, that flashlight, that accountability really up levels everybody's game, right? Once people start knowing that they're getting measured for something, all of a sudden they pay more attention to it. <laughs> and so again, that's really kind of been our theme is how do we, again, shine a flashlight on what was traditionally a black hole and really empower people to go and make meaningful change by giving them that connectivity that they've never really had before. And I think one thing to add to Curtis's um, uh, sort of uh, use case it is super powerful. So just imagine a situation where I'm a PCP, I'm seeing a patient, I refer them through the tool. So I'm using the tool to connect them to a, a care team. Social worker uncovers that this patient has got some challenges uh, with some sort of social determinant. And then I know I can just grab the tool and connect them to the resource in the community. It's just much more likely to happen. 
if the situation is not connected like that, um, then, then it's so much easier for that connection to never occur. For the, even for the research to try to look for something to never occur. The, the conversation much more likely would end with, you know, you might want to check with so-and-so and see if you can find a resource to get <laughs> what you need rather than, oh, I know there's a, there's a whole, uh, you know, library of different resources that are available in this community and I just need to find the one I need and send the patient on their way. So th there's just a, the ease factor, I think, contributes to the success. Yeah. yeah, you know, Jeff, and I'm sorry to jump in here, John, but Jeff, you may want to talk a little bit about your uh, medication management program, right? That's something that we worked with you guys on, saw tremendous success, right? So I'm a PCP, I'm sitting here, hey, John, how are you doing keeping up to date on all the different meds that you're on? Hey, I'm doing a terrible job. Well, we're going to facilitate <laughs> that. Let's hand you off to our pharmacy team that's going to go in and help and, and help you get on, get, a, get on top of that. So Jeff, and that might be a, a real good use case that, uh, that you might want to talk through. It's just a different use case. And, and um, yeah, and I, I think it's a super impactful one as well. And, and it involves so many things across uh, the, the healthcare spectrum. So uh, again, as an example, if I'm a PCP, I'm seeing a patient, they're diabetic, maybe they're new diabetic, um, and I need to prescribe a medication. Then through the tool, I can actually connect them to our, um, to our pharmacy team, which is part of our care team. So they're actually now engaged in a communication with the pharmacist about their medication, who's gonna take the time to go through and really understand what that patient understands from a, from a baseline. Um, understand if the patient maybe has any uh, pre preconceived ideas. A family member had the same medication and, you know, they didn't have a good result. So I'm not really excited about taking this medication. You know, really understand what might be driving challenges for that patient to successfully engage in a medication program. But in addition to that, they're listening and asking questions and doing discovery to try to understand if there are other things outside of that pharmacist patient relationship that could be impactful. And then through, our, through um, the connection engagement tools we use at Callus, they're able to connect them to someone on the care team um, that maybe is a diabetes educator or uh, a nutritionist or um, a social worker that can help connect them to additional resources so that there's this more integrated approach to taking care of a patient. And then the patient really starts to feel known by the people who are taking care of them. They've got this across the organization, a group of people who are asking questions getting answers and, and, and driving that into action and, and improving outcomes. So it's, it's, a, it's something to behold. Uh, there's a lot of power there. Uh, and it, it's exciting to think about what that could look like 10 years from now. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the interesting question, kind of circling back to where we started is how we pay for all of this. You know, mm -hmm. is, is the solution more value-based programs? Is it just that simple that it changes that model of thinking? Or, you know, like, what, what do you think, Jeff, on, you know, on how do we pay for this? How do we, how do we embrace models that make this, you know, not just acceptable, but the norm? Yeah, I think we do maybe three things. I'd probably throw out three big buckets. One is invest more in primary care. So just there's so few dollars that actually are earmarked towards primary care. 5% of the spend um, is going to primary care. If you invested more in primary care, if you doubled that, uh, just think of the number of team members that we could pull on to really help right. expand the scope of what we do. So that's where those dollars would go. It's not about putting more money in the PCP pockets. It's about arming the PCP with the tools and resources that they need to actually deliver better care. The second I would say is uncouple the fee-for-service piece. Um, fee-for-service, like I said, it's, it's, it's designed to operate a sick care engine. If we move to more of a prospective payment capitated model, even if we just started with pay the PCP a capitated rate for care that's, that has um, some more meat on the bone, um, then I think we would see care delivery change dramatically. Um, it, we would no longer bring our diabetics in four times a year just because I need a face-to-face -face with you so that I can bill for it, do some things. I would have a longitudinal experience with that patient. I would use care team members. I it, it just would be different. Um, and then the third, I would say, is move eventually to more of a full risk model for primary care providers where they're responsible for, for um, all the downstream costs of care for patients um, so that they actually have the ability and the lever and the, um, the opportunity to control things, to use tools like um, leading reach to, to really direct side of service, pay for the specialist for the care that they're delivering, make sure the specialists are aligned with the same type of value-based approach for patient care. Um, I think that's how you really, sh you know, turn this giant ship. Um, it's going to probably take some steps, um, but, but I think that would 
I think that would get us there. That's a great description. I'm gonna have to cut that and share it on social. <laughs> I think that's a perfect description of how we need to evolve our yeah. our payment models. It's so well oh, done, well, Cur Curtis. You. Anything you'd add? I mean, obviously you have customers from both sides of the aisle, if you will. Uh, <laughs> what yep. do you see? Um, I'm a big believer in value based care, um, and you know, again, I'm I'm a tech guy who came into healthcare, kind of kind of fell into it backwards. So I, I didn't wake up one day trying to change the world and doing what we're doing. Um, I got some great mentors like Dr. Bullard and Dr. Crow and the folks at, at Catalyst really showed us the way. And once I started to understand kind of what value based care was all about, I became a big believer, right? And, you know, I've I've got a background. I studied economics in college. I'm a classic capitalist entrepreneur, so you know, I can appreciate kind of mindset and and again what what fee for service does. And as I alluded to earlier if i'm an orthopedic surgeon and i really enjoy doing what i do and you know i've, I've gone through college and, and and really studied for so long to, to get to this point in my career you know I, i'm going to want to do a knee surgery right you know think about your orthopod right if, he, if you showed up to him and said hey i can either do pt or i can do a surgery he's going to want to do the surgery rather than refer you off to off to physical therapy because that's what he enjoys and he may want to buy a new bmw right i mean that's just the reality yeah. of kind of the, the fee-for-service universe so I'm a big believer, again, in the, the power of primary care. My father's a nurse practitioner, right? So, or, and, and so we've been, we've been hearing this, you know, my, my entire life around this. <laughs> it is, it is that core, you know, that team, that, that person who really has that holistic view of the patient, right? And, and so I'm a big believer in this model, right? And, and I do believe that we have to incentivize for it, right? We have to, again, you know, empower, you know, what Dr. Bullard was talking about, take that 5%, bump it up 10% and give these PCPs the tools and the teams really that they need. It's a, it's a headcount thing from my perspective, right? Again, we know that, that the PCP as well intentioned as, as they are can only spend a couple of hours or a couple of, of minutes with, with a patient in, in each encounter, but it's that team that we work with. We don't typically work with doctors. Our users are the MAs, the schedulers, the referral coordinators that support staff around the providers and you know, we all know that burnout is a big deal right now in healthcare and staffing is a huge deal right now in healthcare, yeah, right? For sure. And so, you know, what we really look to is how do we empower that, you know, that hourly worker, that's a high turnover position many times, how do we empower them to do their jobs better and make their lives easier? And so again, you know, those are the resources that we see that make a big impact, right? And again, empowering those PCPs to hold that network accountable. And again, you know, once you do this well and do it at scale, a guy like Dr. Burlard can go and talk to that orthopod and say, hey, you know what? I want you to make sure that when you see this patient that's on this plan, here are the behaviors I want you to take, right? I want you to be mindful of side of service selection, right? Because that blows up the cost structure, right? I want you to be mindful of, hey, if we could do PT instead of straight to surgery, let's go and do that. And, you know, Dr. Crow and Dr. Bullard talk a lot about, you know, back surgeries up in North Texas and how expensive they are and, and how many times they're unnecessary. And these are the kind of challenges and, and problems that we're trying to help them address by giving them the data, right? Give them that accountability and, and, and giving them that, that connection um, that allows them to, to start to have these conversations in a more meaningful way. Yeah. Excellent. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. I appreciate both of you being with us and uh, sharing your perspectives on, on, on important topics. And really, I think it's fundamentally the shift in care that's happening in healthcare today. So thanks so much. And thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great health IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. And also find us on your favorite uh, streaming platform, YouTube, or your favorite podcast network. Uh, and be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Curtis. Jeff. You bet. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.